Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this is Startup Grind New York City. Um, uh, hopefully everyone, I know we can't really see anyone, but Madeline pointed out that I am in fact wearing my my, my, uh, my, my, my Christmas sweater. It's a really uh, good day for one right now. If you're in New York City, then you are hunkering down with us uh, during a snowstorm, or if you're anywhere else in the Northeast, um, it is really starting to come down out there. Um, and so this is the time to have that, that nice lamb's wool, fair isle Christmas sweater with the festive lights in the background. Hopefully you got uh, a good warming cocktail in your hand um, or, or a good cup of tea. Um, so we're really excited that you're here. Um, we, this is our last event of the year, um, and we are really going out with a bang. Uh, we're really excited to have Mike Wilner here from Amazon Web Services Early Stage Startups team, and he is gonna be walking us through, as you can see here, Fundraising 201, how to raise a seed round efficiently. Um, I am, uh, I'm Joshua Ness, I'm one of the directors here uh, with Startup Ground New York City and with Verizon 5G Labs. Um, I am not in need of raising a seed round right now, but I am sure gonna be glued to the screen as soon as Mike gets started, because this is gonna be some top-notch material um, from the folks who, uh, who definitely understand what they're looking for um, when it comes to startups to partner with. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we wanna make sure that uh, we give him uh, all ample opportunity um, to walk us through everything there is to, is to know. Uh, we got a few folks in the chat um, Madeline is actually with uh, Startup Grind uh, headquarters. We're super happy that she's here hanging out with us. And a um, uh, big thanks to her for um, making sure we, uh, uh, we have all the resources we need and uh, at, at times making sure we, uh, we stay on track and stay on the rails. Um, as well as it looks like we have uh, a few folks from the Startup Grind, uh, uh, Startup Grind Berlin. That's awesome, welcome. What time is it there? Six, six hours? Five to 11 o'clock at night, man. All right, well, that's commitment right there. Monica, glad to have you there in the audience. Um, Theon, did you have anything else you wanted to share before we get started? One moment. Yep, we can hear you. There we go, okay, awesome. Um, no, that'll be all again. If you all have any type of questions, uh, between each section, um, Mike will allow for a question or two, um, but again, we'll have a extended question around at the very end. Uh, uh, in the chat section, you should see the chat as well as Q&A. And so you can drop your questions in there and we'll be good to go. Um, and they'll be filled in later on. Yep. And if you do have a, a question, please be, just be sure to put your actual questions. If you want like to address it, put it in the Q&A section. Yes. Um, if you want to uh, just chat in general, then leave that in the general section. Looks like we got a lot of really great um, people to talk, talking about where they're coming in from, uh, from New Rochelle, Boston, uh, snowy Athens, Ohio, man. I hope you, uh, we were just talking about all the things that we need to get through uh, one snowy night here. I imagine that uh, you're going to have a little more than just one night. Um, anyway, uh, without further ado, um, Mike, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, Theon and I are going to come off video and, and give the floor to you. Um, please feel free to take it away, but we will be here in the background um, making sure that everything on the back end runs efficiently. So if you have any questions or anything, just just give a shout and we'll come, we'll come on hang and hang out. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. And then thanks, you guys, for the, for setting me up for that. Um, so uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. My name is Mike Wilner. I'm on the AWS startup team. I'll give you a little bit of an explanation of what the heck the startup team does in AWS, as, as well as my background, so you know where I'm coming from. Because before you take anyone's advice on startup stuff, you should understand the context from which it's coming from. Um, so I'm on the startup team here at AWS. And the startup team here is basically a group of former founders, investors, startup executives, whose core job is to help startups be successful. Now, part of that is helping startups be successful with AWS by connecting them to different resources that our team has, like our uh, credit program, which is AWS Activate and, and other resources. But we also help with other parts of building a startup, right? So again, a bunch of former founders, investors, and startup executives, we can help with topics that are much outside of AWS. So for example, one thing that I help a lot of founders out with is fundraising, which is what we're going to be talking about today. In terms of uh, my background, I'm a former founder. So I was a Venture for America fellow back in 2013, was in Detroit working for startups for two years. Uh, ended up starting my own startup in Philly in 2015. 
that was a startup called Compass, not the real estate Compass, I, I wish. Um, my startup was more like Upwork, but specifically for web design projects. So if you wanted to hire a web designer, you could use our platform and, and work with a freelancer. I uh, did that for about three and a half years. Um, went through the process of raising around a million bucks, growing, doing really well for a while, uh, then hitting uh, some pretty hard uh, growth ceilings and having to pivot the business. Ended up pivoting it to client billing software for freelancers, which did okay, not fantastic, um, before just deciding to kind of sell it off for parts and move on. So have a long three and a half year roller coaster journey of, of building a startup. Um, after that, I spent about eight months working with early stage founders, helping them raise money and, and working with early stage VCs, helping them uh, invest in early stage startups. So I was kind of working both sides of the table. Uh, during that time, I ended up running a, a, a Google doc that got longer and longer and longer on just the fundraising advice I was giving over and over again. That pretty spontaneously turned into a book that I co-wrote with a, a friend who um, you know, had raised more money than I had uh, through some top tier investors, but we had very unique fundraising experiences. So I ended up pretty spontaneously writing a book on fundraising before joining the startup team here. And so I kind of just kept helping startups with fundraising. So I've done this workshop a bunch. Um, I've helped a lot of startups with fundraising. Um, this is called Fundraising 201, Raising the Seed Round Efficiently. Uh, you all will get the, the slides afterwards. One thing I want to say, I call this Raising a Seed Round Efficiently. Another way of framing this would be, um, if I were raising a seed round today, this is how I would do it, right? So we're, we're going to go through a lot of stuff today. Um, this is pretty comprehensive. And again, we'll pause throughout the, way, throughout the presentation um, and open it up for some questions. So make sure if you do have questions along the way, just throw them in the Q&A section. And we'll have some uh, checkpoints where I can kind of uh, check a few off, but we'll also have time at the end that we'll leave open for Q&A. So with that, we'll get started. So let's talk about fundraising 201, raising a seed round efficiently. Uh, first, we have to answer this question. Well, um, you'd be surprised how different the answers can be, and we have to get uh, on the same page about that before we go too far. So it's a lot more than just venture capital. This is what a lot of folks think about when they think about seed capital. But you can see a 200K seed round. You can see a $20 million seed round, right? What does it all mean? Um, more than just VC, you have a lot of funding sources on the non-venture capital side from non-dilutive grants to friends and family to angels, angel funds and groups, and accelerators. Uh, you have funding sources on the VC side that are more nuanced with dedicated pre-seed VCs, dedicated seed stage VCs, multi-stage VCs, and corporate VCs. This is a relatively long list, but it's not even exhaustive, right? I, I haven't even talked about family offices or like solo GPs or micro VCs, right? There are a lot of different types of investors. And the key takeaway here is that you don't wanna paint investors with a broad brush when you're thinking about fundraising, especially at the seed stage. All these investors are different, they have different motivations. They have different ways that they make decisions. Uh, they have different incentives. And it's really important to break it down more granularly because understanding how each of these investors works is going to influence your fundraising process. And it's going to influence who you want to work with and uh, who you target within your fundraise, right? And so um, diving deeper into these different types is really important before you just paint all investors with a broad brush. Uh, so how long should fundraising take? I'll, I'll leave it to the chat group. Who Throw in your, your guesses. How long should it take to raise a seed round? I'll pause until I see a few responses here. 12 weeks, okay. One year, six months, nine weeks, three to six months. A lot of, a lot of three to six months um, stuff here. Uh, the truth is, uh, that experienced founders that have done this before can put a seed round together in as quickly as a month, right? Um, and so it can be really fast. Um, you should aspire for it to be really fast. I do want to be very clear here. My first time raising a seed round, it took me six months, right? So, um, you know, but what we're going to be doing today is unpacking what it looks like under the hood when a seed round does happen this quickly. 
and, and some of the ways that you can use that to put it into practice. And so the secret here, how do you raise a round that quickly? The key is just to generate authentic competition for your round, giving investors FOMO and a sense of urgency. Right? That's really what this comes down to. Now, I'm not, I don't have any magic words that you can say to generate FOMO with investors. Also, it does have to be a good investment in order to generate some of this FOMO, right? But um, we are going to unpack some very practical things here that you can do um, that, that actually influence FOMO and a sense of urgency with investors. And that's what we're, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so here's what we're going to cover. We're gonna first address like, when do you raise seed capital? That's an important factor. Um, we'll talk about some ground rules that, about raising a seed round. Uh, we'll talk about drafting your round composition. To, so thinking about the types of investors you want to have in your seed round. It's a really important part of cultivating a sense of urgency and competition. Crafting your fundraising narrative. So how do you talk about your seed round? Uh, and how do you talk about the progress that you've made? Building your initial funnel initiating fundraising mode and stacking up meetings and then pitching and closing. So we're really gonna talk about the full fundraising process today. So let's get started with a quick primer on, on just when to raise seed capital. I'd like to get oriented here first. So the first thing I like to say is don't fundraise because you think you should, only do it as a means to an end, right? At, at the end of the day, fundraising is giving away equity in your company. Right? So, so you shouldn't just do it just to do it. Uh, you know, raising money is actually expensive for you as a founder. Um, and so you should really have a very clear sense of why you're raising money. And we'll talk about this more when we discuss fundraising narrative. Um, but don't just feel like because you see a lot of other founders raising money or because you think it's the thing to do that you should raise money. I'll be totally honest, my first round, I, I felt some of this pressure and we probably went out and raised a round before we really needed to. Um, and it was a little bit of a distraction. So you, you need to have a very clear sense of why you're raising money um, and not just do it because you think you should be raising money. So here, here's what I recommend uh, for when you should raise money. Only do it when the following are true. First is you have a compelling fundraising narrative and capital is the constraint to achieving your next milestone. So again, we'll talk about narrative in a bit, but you should always be thinking about what your next business milestone is. Um, and a big thing you have to ask yourself is, do you actually need money to achieve that? If the answer is no, then by all means, keep bootstrapping or quasi bootstrapping or whatever you need to do to, to hit those milestones so you don't have to dilute yourself. Um, but you really should only be fundraising when the thing that you need in order to hit that next milestone is capital. Uh, you also wanna be standing on solid ground. So you either wanna have positive momentum where things are going well, or be in a position of optionality. So when I say position of optionality, what I mean is you don't wanna be bleeding money. It's really hard to fundraise from a position of strength if you uh, like desperately need the money. And so even if it means like bootstrapping or you know cut, cutting certain costs, whatever it might be, if you can put yourself in a position where when you're talking to investors, you can say, yeah, we'd like to raise a round, but push come to shove, we'll be okay even if we don't. If you can find yourself in that position, it just makes everything a lot easier. So try to get yourself on solid ground before you actually fundraise. You also should have a strong conviction that you'll be successful doing it. Uh, this is one of the big secrets here is, is experienced founders, when they go out to fundraise, it's not a huge risk. They're not taking a huge risk. Um, they know some investors who are already going to be in. Um, and before they kind of open things up, they, they know that they're going to be successful. So you can never know for sure, um, but you should have really strong conviction that before you set out to fundraise, that if you set out to fundraise, you will likely be successful doing it. Um, so let's talk about some ground rules for raising a seed round. Assuming that you now want to go out and raise, we'll talk about some ground rules and then we'll pause for some, some questions that might be stacking up. So rule number one with fundraising, you're either in full fundraising mode or you're not at all. 
Uh, this needs to be black and white. It, it's really easy to get caught in the gray area here. Usually the way that gray area happens is, you know, you're talking to people, you're networking, someone offers an introduction to an investor. Sounds like a good person to meet. So you, you take that introduction. They ask you some questions. Next thing you know, they're asking you for a deck. So you're putting together a deck for one investor. That's not a fundraising process. Right, that's just kind of reacting to, to one investor. Um, and so it's, it's really important that you're very clear about whether you are fundraising or not. And one of the best possible things you can say to an investor is that you are not fundraising. So if you've not done the homework and you've not really been intentional about, you know, flipping the switch and going into full fundraising mode, by all means, tell investors that you're not fundraising and just talk about the business and see if they can help you and use it as an opportunity to build a relationship outside of the ask for money, right? Um, this is one of the best things you can say to investors. It'll make them want to talk to you more. It'll make them want to stay closer to you. Uh, and it's just the truth. If you're not yet ready to fundraise, you shouldn't feel like you need to fundraise just because you find yourself uh, talking to an investor. So be very, very clear about this. And um, ultimately, you're going to need to turn the switch on at some point. And that's a really important piece of the founder. And you only want to turn on fundraising mode when you are good and ready to do so and ready to move really, really quickly. Rule number two, fundraising should be one person's full-time job. So one of the reasons that fundraise, my first fundraise took me six months is because I tried to spend 50% of my time focused on fundraising, 50% of my time as CEO. Um, mediocre during that period, right? And I wasn't able to build enough momentum to make the, the round move quickly uh, because I was, uh, you know, so split. And so usually this is the CEO's job. I've seen it be the COO's job in some cases. Um, but really it should be one person managing everything. Uh, this, you know, you can have co-founders that are maybe helping make introductions, but it really should be one person at the company that is kind of shouldering this burden so that it doesn't become a distraction for others and so that you can have just consistent communication there. Uh, so yeah, and one of the things here that's tough is the first thing you need to do is delegate operational responsibilities. Right, so one person needs to be able to spend like 80% of their time uh, focused on fundraising. Rule number three, fundraise in parallel, not in sequence, and put yourself in a position to say no to investors. So what I mean here is, when I say not in sequence, you shouldn't be going to one investor trying to get to a yes or a no, then going to another investor getting into a yes or a no. You need to be managing a funnel where you're, you're talking to many investors simultaneously or in parallel, right? And when I say put yourself in a position to say no, what I mean is that well-run fundraise processes, at the very end of them, founders find themselves in the very awkward position where they have to tell investors who want to write a check that they can't. There's no more room, right? And, and that's when you have to actually uh, have a very robust funnel um, and, and then you can actually you know, get to that point. We'll go into building the funnel and building that pipeline later. Um, but th this is really what you need to do in order to create that sense of urgency. Uh, we'll talk about this later. This, the, what I use here is the three by one rule for fundraising in parallel. This means that you should have, for every spot on your cap table that you have available for the round, you should have three investors in final diligence. Uh, getting to that ratio at the bottom of your funnel is a very mathematical way to ensure that you are instilling that authentic uh, competition for your round and that FOMO, right? You don't have to make up any magic words or say any magic phrases if the reality is that there are three answers in the final stages for every spot available. And, and that's the equation that we'll work backwards from when we start talking about building a funnel. Rule number four, Time kills all deals. So this applies to individual investors and it applies to your round as a whole. So with individual investors, the longer you give someone to think about it and consider the investment, the higher the chances that they're going to say no. At the early stages, good investors can get to a yes pretty quickly. So if you're giving them forever and not giving them any you know, urgency, 
to make a decision, they're just going to drag it along and, and the chances are going to go up that they're going to say no. This also applies to your round as a whole. So the longer that it takes to fundraise, the harder it's going to get. But if you're fundraising for a month and things are moving really quickly and you have momentum, then there's going to be this sense of urgency that folks have. But if you're fundraising for three, four, five months, it's going to start to become a negative signal to investors that there must be some reason why it's taking you three, four, five months to put together a round. Right. And so this is, again, why it's really important to compress this time frame. Um, even if you end up spending a month or, or two preparing to fundraise, but you are not fundraising, right? Um, and then you, you turn the switch on after one or two months of prep and you know nurturing relationships, and then you fundraise really quick, you do want to press the time that you're around to as tight of a window as possible so that you can move really, really quickly and have really high momentum throughout this process. So we're going to talk about drafting your round composition and thinking about the types of investors you want to have in your round. I'm going to and take a look at this Q&A field. Um, ooh, a bunch of stuff here. Um, great. A uh, really good question came in here. Here, uh, They say if you uh, approach for someone for money, they'll give you advice. And if you approach someone for uh Advice will give you money. But if you're in full fundraising mode, approaching someone for advice is a uh, subterfuge. How do you get around this riddle? So we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, this is where it's really important to be nurturing relationships before you are fundraising. So you can genuinely, like, and the key is where it is genuinely here, genuinely ask for advice from people who you will take the advice from, right? Uh, that sometimes goes unsaid, but it's really important. Um, and, and so I think uh, if you can do that before you are fundraising, you're going to build some genuine relationships. And then once you're fundraising, uh, you, you should be clear about what you're asking for, right? But you can hopefully have built those relationships when fundraising is not the clear ask, but some other ask that was genuine. So I think it's all about when. when that switch. That's why it's important to wait to flip the switch, because when you are not fundraising, you can actually genuinely seek people's advice in a way that is not transparently actually trying to get their money. Because a lot of investors can see through that, the whole ask for advice thing. Um, so uh, it, it's important to be genuinely asking for advice right, in an area where you think someone is disproportionately able to provide that advice. Um, so next question here. Um, how do you describe the role of a CEO and CFO in a seed fundraising effort? So, you know, usually in, at the seed stage, it's a little more rare to have a CFO. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the CEO is in charge of storytelling and in the seed stages, a lot of what investors are looking for is not, you know, if there's someone on the team who has a robust background in investment banking or private equity, but if there's someone that can like tell the story that can, get investors on board, get other investors on board, get customers on board, get future employees on board. That is what is really important. So I do think it's important to have someone who's like really good at the storytelling leading the fundraising, more so than it is someone who, you know, has a good mastery of the metrics. The CEO needs to have that as well. There might be a COO or a CFO at the company that has that mastery, uh, but really it should be the CEO or someone who's able to tell the story um, who can, um, do that. Uh, some other questions, and we'll need to keep moving. Um, one here, uh, are you saying that you don't tailor your deck for individual investors? Um, I wouldn't. I think your fundraising narrative is your fundraising narrative. That if you splinter your deck narrative into a bunch of different versions for a different bunch of different people, it's hard to hold that in your head as a founder. Um, what I will say is different investors will want to dive into different parts of the business. So if you're a life one investor who is a machine learning focused investor, another investor that's a life sciences focused investor, they're going to have different things that they're going to want to dive deeper into. Your higher level narrative should be consistent, but you should fully expect that you're 
went down one rabbit hole with one investor and another rabbit hole with another investor. But I would say the high level narrative really be consistent for every investor you're talking to. Uh, do, do, do. All right, lots of questions coming in. Um, we are going to talk, some of these questions we are addressing later. So uh, I'm going to keep moving here. And at the end, we haven't answered them. I'll try to answer all of them. So let's keep going with drafting your round composition and thinking about the types of investors that you want to have in your round. Uh, so the key here is to create scarcity by working backwards from your ideal cap table. Um, so what I mean here is, you know, if you're, you think about the example of raising a million dollar round, it can be very daunting, right? I remember when I was first raising, okay, I, I've got to go raise, you know, from my first name, 350 k that just felt like a ton of money to go start asking for. Um, and it is daunting when you just look at that number. But if you, tr if you break it down, it gets a lot easier. For example, in this $2 million round, if you think about what your cap table should look like at the end of it, that might be one lead VC writing an 800K check, two follow-on VCs taking up another 600K, maybe five angels taking up the remaining 600K. Um, so the, uh, you know, it's just one example. It might look a lot different uh, for your startup, but, you know, um, but when you break it down this way, we just went from... I've got to raise this $2 million round to I've got eight spots on the team, right? And this converts from a asking for money exercise to a recruiting exercise, much like you would recruit members of your team. And you can start to get pretty specific about what you want from these types of investors. And this is going to really help you with prospecting. One question I always get is, where do you start when trying to do prospecting? Well, I say, start with the types of investors you want. That's going to help you get more specific. For example, if you're just trying to say, I've got to go find some angels, that's paralyzing. There are so many different types of angel investors. Um, but if instead, with these five angels, you get even more specific and say, you want two angels who are you know, former founders of successful startups in your space, and two angels who are Fortune 1000 executives that have experience navigating compliance within your industry, right? Like you can get pretty specific, almost like these are job descriptions. Um, and that's going to help you find the right people uh, and quite frankly, build more, build a bigger funnel for these specific spots, right? Um, and so being really intentional about the types of investors you want in your round is really helpful here. And so take the amount that you're looking to raise and really break it down into these different spots for the different you know, members of the team that you want to recruit um, and use that to, to build a funnel. And so in order to think about this round composition, you do need to think about the different types of investors, right? VCs are very different from angels and all those other different investor types I mentioned at the beginning. And so we've got to take a second to start to understand these investors. And we're going to start with some empathy for VCs, right? VCs are not the enemy here. Uh, so you know, being a successful VC is hard. We we'll use an example of a VC that has $10 million to invest in 33 different startups. So with this VC, let's say that 10 of the investments fail, 11 return their money, six generate 3x returns, then three generate 5x returns, two generate 20x, and then there's one big 50x return. In this example, even with you know six investments that are over 5x, one that's 50x, this VC is doing pretty well. They're not killing it by any means. They're doing pretty well. On the other hand, if this one 50x investment from this VC's portfolio was instead 5x, sounds pretty good to 5x an investment. This VC goes from doing pretty well to doing very poorly, right? And so this is all to say venture capital is an outlier game. And generally speaking, the seed stage VC rule of thumb is that every investment they make needs to have the potential to return the entire fund, which is roughly 50x returns when you account for dilution. Now, that doesn't mean they, they expect every investment to generate 50x returns means they need to believe that it can. This is something that I struggled with 
angel round. I talked to an investor who told me, hey, Mike, we, we think this is a good business you've got here, but we think uh, at its best, it's a $200 million business. And that's just not a high enough upside for us. I was very confused hearing that. To me, it sounded like a great outcome to have a $200 million business. But to them, the fact that that was the ceiling was a problem. They needed to believe it had more upside than that because uh, they needed to believe that it could really return their entire fund. Um, and so this is a lot of the times how VCs are going to think. Not every VC thinks exactly this way, um, but most of the time, this is how VCs are going to think. VCs are also going to want you to keep climbing the VC path. So, you know, if you think you're just going to go raise a seed round from some venture capital investors and then just be profitable and run your business the way you want for, till the end of time, that's probably not how it's going to go. Um, so at the seed stage, VCs will want you to raise a subsequent round of capital in the next 12 to 18 months at an even higher valuation so that they can show that their investment is good. Right? and they can pass along that risk to downstream investors. And so um, VCs are gonna want you to usually stay on that VC path. Uh, so that is a, an important consideration when thinking about raising a seed round. Uh, so I wanna swing to the other side of the fence with angel investors so we can understand the different sides of the spectrum. So angel investors have much more diverse motivations. So while VCs are, are you know, fiduciaries and, and are trying to get a return on investment, uh, angel investors may invest because they're trying to become a VC, right? And so it's a, a little bit of a way of practicing uh, because they're bored and are interested in the space that you're building in because uh, you went to the same alma mater or, or are from the same hometown and they want to support entrepreneurs from that school or hometown, right? There are many reasons why angel investors might invest and, and it's up to you to figure out what does motivate them. Um, but they have much more diverse motivations than VCs. They also have a lower bar for what a good outcome might be. So for VCs, while they may want those really big outlier returns, um, an angel investor might be really happy with a 5X return over three years. That's not a great return for a VC, but that could be a great return for an angel. Um, so they generally will have a lower bar for what a good outcome is. And angel investors are much more likely to be more passively involved. So while VCs might push you to make certain hiring decisions, may push you to raise subsequent rounds of capital, may push you to make other decisions, uh, they might take board seats and actually not just push you to do those things, but have the ability to literally push you and influence you to do those things through their voting rights. Um, you know, angels are much less likely to do that, right? They're usually going to be on the sidelines being supportive, but... Uh, by raising from angels, you can retain a little bit more autonomy around the business. Uh, so some takeaways from round composition before we uh, go into some other questions. Understand how the investor's business works, right? It's important to understand how they think on the other side of the table, um, no matter what type of investor they are. Make sure your goals are aligned with the investors, right? If they want to grow a business crazy fast and you want to be more conservative or vice versa, um, then like it's not a good fit and you should make sure you're thinking about what success looks like for them and make sure you're aligned. Be deliberate about the types of investors you want in your round. Again, this is an opportunity to recruit from your team. And so don't just think about this as raising money. Think about who you're trying to bring on the team and why. And draft your round composition before you start talking to investors. Keyword here is draft. Um, you should fully expect that you, know, you may come up with this round composition and as you go through the fundraising process, it might change, might evolve. Your thinking might evolve. The people you get introduced to might cause you to make different decisions. Um, but having a sense of this before you start talking to investors is just gonna help you with prospecting. It's going to help you come across as more experienced when you talk to these investors and, and talk to them about where you think you think they fit into your round rather than just you know letting them dictate that. Um, it's gonna really help with the whole process if you draft this before you start talking to investors. And so next we'll talk about crafting your fundraising narrative. Um, but before we do that, got some questions. Someone just came in in the chat. 
tips for convincing an investor to lead the round. Um, so investors, some investors don't lead. It's just the way they do business is that they will only follow, right? So you can't force someone who does not lead to lead. <laughs> if the way they do things is they follow and that's what they're going to do. I will say if an investor does lead, um, then if they have high enough conviction, they will lead. They will want to lead, right? They will want to get as much equity as they can. Um, and so, you know, the, the way to think about this is to, you, know, you can only have one lead investor. Um, one thing we'll talk about a little bit later is one misconception that folks have around lead investors is, is that you have to get a lead first. That is not true. Um, more often than not, you get smaller investors first and build momentum to the point where your round is, is like moving. Um, and you can cultivate a sense of urgency with lead investors because there's only one route, one spot for a lead. Uh, and if you have momentum from angels and other smaller investors, that can create a sense of urgency. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but having a round that is moving with or without a lead, the lead is one of the best ways to convince a lead to, to jump on. Um, other questions that came in. Do, do, do. Just trying to. Okay. Well, we'll talk about some of these later. Um, one person asked a good question around nurturing before fundraising. Um, you know, before fundraising, like, if you have specific asks, you should, you should have specific reasons why someone can help. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, but uh, we're going, you know, a lot of these questions we're gonna address in a bit. So I'm gonna keep moving. Um, and if we don't answer these questions, we will come back to them. Uh, two, two, two. Cool. So let's talk about crafting your fundraising narrative. Uh, this is important to a lot of things, including valuation, which someone just asked about. So crafting your fundraising narrative, what is a fundraising narrative? It's not just a pitch deck. Um, it's more it's more high level than your pitch deck. I would, I would advise getting really clear about your fundraising narrative before you even create a pitch deck. Um, this is a rant for a different time, but I'm not even really big on having pitch decks altogether. Uh, <laughs> but what is a fundraising narrative? Uh, it's a concise explanation of what you do, what's most compelling about your business, why you're raising money, and your long-term vision, right? So in short, this is the entire why behind your fundraise. This needs to be so concise and compelling that if you tell your fundraising narrative to an investor, they should be able to hold it in their head and even after having 20 other meetings with founders, they should be able to recite your fundraising narrative to someone else the same way that you recited it to them. So it needs to be really crisp. And this is that top level thing that you're going to use throughout your fundraise. That's going to be the why behind your fundraise. And we're going to break this down. So a good fundraising narrative can do the following in 30 seconds. The first 15 seconds, you need to simply explain what you do, simply being the keyword. And you need, to, you need to communicate the central thesis behind the investment, AKA why you will win or what the investor is truly betting on, right? We'll, we'll break that down a little bit further, but that's what you need to communicate in the first 15 seconds. And then the second 15 seconds, you outline your progress to date, future milestones and long-term vision. So uh, we'll go through some examples here. Here's a bad example from a real startup I worked with. Um, well, I modified it slightly so you can't pinpoint the startup uh, of an explanation of what they do. So I want everyone to read this and throw into the chat if you have a guess of what this company does. Sounds like IBM, it's funny. Uh, podcast stuff. That's that's close. Yeah. Um, right. I, I remember I read this like three times when I when I met this company. Um, wow, someone someone actually hit it. Wow, that's impressive. Um, but I, I I couldn't figure out what they did. Uh, and at the end of the day, someone guessed it. Congrats, Craig. Um, 
we're an analytics tool for podcasters. This is what they did, right? And, and ju just say it, just say what you do. Um, you'll have plenty of time to talk about the long-term vision if, if someone can understand really simply what you do. But if, if you use buzzwords and have this complex way of uh, describing what you do because you want it to sound exciting, um, then someone's going to, their eyes are going to glaze over, they're going to stop listening, and, and it's not going to help. Right? So just say what you do in simple terms. Uh, and then you want to communicate that central thesis behind the investment, or why you'll win. Another way I like to talk, talk about this is if an investor is writing a Medium post a few months after making the investment, why are they saying that they're going to, that they made the investment? Right? What, what are they saying that they're truly betting on? If they're going to bang their fist on the table to their partners and say, this is why we need to do this deal, this is what they're going to say. And so this requires a lot of thought as a founder of what your central thesis is behind the investment. And it's really that one reason why an investor should invest. So this could be some story around how you've unlocked this non-obvious traction channel and you've kind of figured out growth. It could be around having the ideal team. Now, the bar here is very high if you're going to say that you have the right team for what you're doing. Um, it can be some unique insight you have on distribution or workflow adoption. Again, these things have to be non-obvious. It can be a case study proving incredible efficacy, right? If you can show that your product is just revolutionary for your customers in a way that, it, like, you know, gives people, pardon my French, uh, like a no shit moment, um, like that, that's that's what you really want to go for, or customer feedback that shows you've built something that people love, right? These are things that are like, you know, really, they make someone's eyes open. Um, and that's really where you have to get to with this central thesis. Um, so here's an example with our uh, analytics tool for podcasters. We're an analytics tool for podcasters, and we're a team of former podcast producers who produced five of the 20 most downloaded podcasts of all time. So this is an example of using the team as that core thesis. This is basically saying, hey, we're an analytics tool for podcasters. And assuming that there is a market here, we are the team to do this because we've seen what this looks like at the highest level. Right? And that's that's what you as an investor are betting on, that this is the right team to work on analytics tools for podcasters. Um, and so that, that's really what you need to think about. And this can be a bunch of different things. And this requires a lot of thought about what this is for you. But it is that central thing that someone is betting on. Next, you want to articulate milestones of de-risking to show your progress and future plans. Um, and so what I mean here when I say milestones of de-risking is you don't want to jump to vanity metrics. A lot of folks think that you need to you know, say you have $1,000 in monthly recurring revenue or $5,000 in monthly recurring revenue or $10,000 in monthly recurring revenue. The truth is, at the early stages of a startup, $1,000, $5,000, $10,000 in monthly recurring revenue, they all round down to zero, right? It's not about those metrics. It's about what they represent and what you've actually figured out and what you've actually de-risked about the business. Investors at this early stage are professional de-riskers and all they do is assess risk. So when an investor is looking at your business, what they are thinking about is what has this company de-risked and what is the big risk that they are currently facing on this trajectory? And so if you can speak that language, um, you're gonna be able to tell a really compelling story. And so what you need to do is talk about your progress to date. So what have you figured out about the business? Again, even if you have $5,000 a month of recurring revenue, it's not about the revenue number. It's about that you've shown that people are willing to pay for your product and they're doing it on a, on a you know, monthly recurring basis, right? And then I have a bunch of other questions about, okay, how often are they using it? But it's more about what those numbers represent, not just the vanity metrics themselves. So what have you figured out about the business? The next milestone, what is the biggest risk you need to address? So what is the next thing you need to figure out? I will say, if you had no big risks, then you would just go to the go to the bank and take out a business loan, right? This is early stage investing. There are big risks. Investors know that. They're going to be looking for what the big risk is. If you do not tell the investor what the big risk is, then they're going to come to their own conclusions, right? So just be proactive and talking about what the biggest risk is facing the business. 
um, that's also going to make you come across as more competent as a founder. And then the future, if you de-risk that next milestone, what does the future then hold? That's where you can really start getting into telling the story of the future vision, right? And so by using these things, you don't have to, you know, talk about traction or revenue or whatever. Um, you can have two companies, one of which that is a SaaS uh, solution, you know, B2B SaaS solution, one of which is, you know, a life science startup, right? It is ridiculous for a seed stage investor to think that a life sciences company should have revenue at the seed stage, right? It is not ridiculous for a seed stage investor to think a B2B SaaS company should have revenue at the seed stage, right? So it's not just about you should have revenue. It's not about, you, you know, every company needs to have this level of traction. It's more about what you've de-risked. And, and that's how early stage investors really think about progress more so than just like arbitrary traction metrics. So make sure you're thinking through this carefully about what this means for your business and what you have really de-risked and what you need to de-risk next and what the future can then look like. And so here's a bad example of how some startups represent this. I was once guilty of this, just to be clear. Um, but one bad example of how startups talk about progress and future milestones. We have 20 customers and we're raising $2 million to continue building out our product and hire a sales team. Even if I said we have, you know, 2K in monthly recurring revenue and we're raising $2 million to uh, continue building out our product and hire a sales team, even if I said 10K MRR, it's still bad, right? As an investor, I don't know what that revenue represents. I don't know if these customers are, how much they're using your product. Uh, I don't know you know, what you're going to be de-risking with this next round. Sure, you're building out your product and hiring a sales team. I would hope so. <laughs> I would hope you're investing in product and sales with a $2 million raise, but I'm, I'm not clear on what you're going to actually achieve and de-risk with that. So um, you're not really telling me much as an investor when you say this. And so here's a good example of talking about progress and future plans. You can say, we found product market fit on a small scale with 20 independent podcasters paying for our product and using it for all of their shows. That's a big deal. That's a way bigger deal than, you know, 10K MRR. Um, so you're basically saying that you found product market fit on a small scale. Um, now we're raising $2 million to find a repeatable customer acquisition strategy so we can start dominating the independent podcaster market. Again, you're acknowledging head on that you do not know how to repeatedly acquire customers here. And that's why you're raising the, the round. Um, but you are hinting at what can start to happen once you do figure that out. And then the future, once we do that, we can go up market to podcast studios, which will give us the most advanced podcast data set in the world. And then we can be the ad network for, you know, podcasts, yada, 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 right? You know, like that's where you can really start to get into the fun stuff that a lot of VCs love talking about. Out. But you have to paint that picture of you know where you are today in terms of de-risking, what you need to do next, and then what the future can then hold. So all of what I just said was pretty qualitative and not super data-driven on that last slide. That's okay. That is where your financial model and, and certain metrics come into play. And so you will support your narrative with a financial model. Um, and the first goal of a financial model is to tell the ver to, to verify the story that you're telling with metrics. The second goal is to show the assumptions that, you, that you're that you making. So a good financial model at the seed stage doesn't show five years of robust metrics because the truth is you're just guessing. Uh, a good financial model at the seed stage has really thoughtful assumptions so that an investor can really think through the or see the assumptions that you're making about the business. And you can even have a productive conversation about what happens when you you know, when your cost of acquisition is actually higher than, you, than you're anticipating or lower than you're anticipating. Or if you need more customer service representatives than you're thinking per, you know, uh, based on the number of customers you have or less, right? You can start playing around with these levers and seeing what happens to the business. Um, and so I, I think that is, that is a more productive use of a financial model at the seed stage. So some takeaways from fundraising narrative and then I'll answer some questions. Uh, first, keep it simple and concise. Frame progress and future milestones of how you're de in terms of how you're de-risking the business. 
back up your narrative with math. Uh, so we'll talk about building your initial funnel next, but I will go ahead and answer some of these questions. Um, someone just asked how detailed will be. Uh, I would say really just like a profit and loss statement, maybe a cash flow statement, just because you know cash flow is important, and then an assumptions tab. The assumptions tab being one of the most important ones. So you can really talk through like here are the key business drivers and key assumptions that are going into you know the, the financials that you're seeing as outputs in the you know profit and loss income statement and cash flow uh, cash flow statement. Um, someone just asked usually here real product market fit is really hard to reach. What else can we use for de-risking? Yeah, so I think you know look if you find true product market fit. Uh, like in a scalable way, that's more like a series A milestone, right? Where you're able to really grow. Um, and so what you can do is like, you can de-risk distribution. One thing that I, I've talked to for like, for founders who are, let's say, building a hardware product where the, the product development cycle is just pretty long, right? What you can do is you can build a community of your customers, Right, and build like a Facebook group or a Slack group or, or whatever. And you can say, hey, we've actually built this community of customers that are providing feedback on the product. And we actually have a, a big network of customers that we've built through this community we've created that actually is our built-in distribution once we have a product that we're ready to go to market with. Right, so you can be a little creative with doing things in parallel and limiting the dependencies on getting like true product market fit. So building a community so that you've kind of de-risked some of the go-to-market is one way. Um, you can run certain small experiments to understand what distribution channels are actually gonna work for you or not, right? So you, if you have data to say, hey, we ran these experiments, we know that by pulling these levers, once we are ready to start scaling, um, that this mix of uh, this referral program and you know this direct-to-consumer channel and this other thing uh, can be a way that we go to market. So it really depends but you can be creative in how you're de-risking uh, the business by reducing the, the de dependencies so that you have like data where you can say, look, we've de-risked all these different parts of the business. Um, you know, there are these things that we need, that we're still figuring out, um, but you can see a lot of what we've de-risked. And it's also important to think about what is the biggest thing you need to de-risk. So it's okay to do like little things independently, but there's gotta be one overwhelming thing that you're you're always looking to de-risk, and that's less just fundraising advice, more just startup advice. Is attack that area of the the biggest risk. Um, another quick question on financial models: If not five years, what would make sense? Yeah, two years is fine. I, I think monthly detail is good. I usually like to think about assumptions on a quarterly basis. Right, so you might say like, hey, in Q1, this is what we're gonna be really focused on. And so therefore this is what the assumptions are going to be during that quarter. Whereas, you know, we're gonna be focused on experimenting with X, Y, and Z in this quarter. And so our assumptions are gonna be a little different, but someone should be able to see on a monthly basis what things look like so they can see what your burn is going to be and other things like that. Um, switching to the question tab. Oh, just a reminder, we are gonna share these slides. Um, so, uh, that usually keeps getting asked. Um, examples of big risks at the seed stage. Um, yeah, I'd say at the seed stage, big risks are like around customer adoption. That's something that a lot of founders often overlook. Even if you have like if you have proof of demand for your product, um, and even proof that customers are willing to pay, getting proof that customers are not only willing to pay, but you can get them to use your product and use it successfully. Uh, is a really big risk that a lot of startups overlook, right? And so to, for a seed stage startup, if you're able to say, hey, not only do we know that customers want to use our product, um, but we know that they want to use it, they're willing to pay for it, and we can get them from wanting to use it to using it successfully within four weeks, that's a big freaking deal. And a lot of startups fail because they have customers that are willing to use their product, they have, or that want to use their product that will pay for it, but they're not able to figure out that adoption hurdle, right? There's some block. This was one challenge that I ran into with my old startup is like we had people that 
we were solving a problem for, they wanted to use it, but there was one little wrinkle of like fully adopting the product and integrating into their workflow that we weren't able to prove. And that's one thing that I look at a lot when I'm thinking about, uh, you know, uh, early stage startups is, you know, do I believe that not only this is something that's solving a customer pain point that people are willing to pay for, but can it be adopted in a way that will allow it to build momentum? So that's one of the big things I look out for. And so to the extent that you can de-risk adoption um, and like value delivery, even if it's through like prototypes or just some, even if it's like customer interviews or a showing that you understand what it takes to get someone from zero to customer success with your product, um, that's a big deal. Uh, doo -doo -doo. How to raise money before, like before having an MVP? Um, it's all about de-risking, right? So, it, truth is, it's hard to raise money before having something real. Um, if you can show that you have the right team and you've de-risked like the team to build this, per build a product in the market that you're building in, then like you might be able to raise pre-product. Um, but I think it's all relative and, and it really gets to thinking about this risk and how you're de-risking this stuff. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, I am going to keep moving uh, and we'll, we'll continue to, uh, let's see here. Actually, one more question just came in. For startups building networks where there's a cold start problem, the chicken and egg problem of data and users, Funding needs to be used for solving that puzzle. Hard to de-risk that. Yeah, like this, this is the chicken and egg problem of a lot of marketplaces, right? Like if you're building a marketplace startup and and uh, you can get creative with that. Um, you know, I think you have to have a clear insight to what your unique, uh, you, you need to know what your unique insight is to solving the chicken and egg problem. One of the big questions that Y Combinator asks marketplace startups is, just that, like, how are you going to solve this chicken and egg problem? What is your unique insight to how you're going to solve this, right? And so having that unique insight and having data and something non-obvious or insights, anecdotes from customers or from your domain experience that shows that you have a unique uh, competitive advantage or unique um, insight on how you're going to solve that chicken and egg problem, even if you don't have the funding or if you haven't solved it yet, I think can be one thing. The other thing there is um, you, know, you can come up with creative ways of doing that, right? I mentioned building a community before. That's often a, a way that a lot of marketplaces do bootstrap that cold start problem, right? They'll say, look, we are building a product and we're starting to figure this stuff out. But we, you know, to start, we're building a Facebook group right? where we're going to kind of try to mimic the behavior we want within our application within our web app or mobile app or whatever, um, we're going to bootstrap that uh, with like an existing platform and just try to like build that community. And, you know, if we can show that we're facilitating this behavior in like a low tech way, then uh, we will be learning and figuring that out. And we're actually going to have an active audience who's used to transacting that we can move over to that to our new platform, right? You can get creative there. Um, but that is a big challenge, right? And it's something that you, you should think about what those risks are with solving that cold start problem and try to unpack that a bit. Cool. Um, let's see. Larry, I'll come back to your question in a bit. I want to make sure we're getting through all this stuff. So let's talk about building your initial funnel. So we talked about this before creating scarcity by working backwards from your ideal cap table, right? Uh, now it's time to use that to, to build a funnel. So you want to work backwards from that three by one rule. If you want to have three investors in final diligence for every one spot on your cap table, then that means you should have, you know, 10 initial meetings for every investor you want on your cap table, which means 20 prospects to start for every investor you want on your cap table. When we look at that, that is roughly 20 prospects. Um, right, and 100, well, 120 prospects, sorry, for every, for, for this round. 
And so we're quickly seeing why this is a full-time job. That's a lot of prospects to start with, but this is what it really takes to move people down the funnel and get to a point where you have scarcity and FOMO at the end. Um, so you wanna work backwards from that three by one rule to build that funnel. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, doing all this at once can be a little daunting. Also, you don't have to get a lead first. Um, staggering this can work to your advantage. What's really important here is that you build momentum. And oftentimes the best ways for startup to, startups to build momentum is by getting smaller investors to commit first, right? Whether it's close angels, uh, smaller VCs, you can build from the bottom up and almost do like coalition building uh, for your round, right? Where you're working with angels, getting them to commit. So maybe the first couple of weeks of your fundraise is really just focused on the, you know, 600K of your round in this example that's focused on angels and you just focus on them. And you get some points on the board and you start to build some momentum and then you can start to work up to VCs and maybe the lead VC is the last investor. Um, one of my friends who, who went through Y Combinator and, and raised a, you know, $2.5 million round that was led by some top tier investors. The way he raised his round was he first went to his existing angel investors, got them to commit, then went to new angels, got them to commit, then went to some smaller VCs, got them to commit. By the time that he was talking to Coastal Ventures, the way the conversation went was, uh, hey, we've raised $1.7 million for this round. Uh, we would love for you to be the cherry on top and lead this round. Um, and like, have you in? If not, cool. We'll go back to some angels and get them to fill in the rest uh, and like get back to work and get back to building this business. So you, you convey the sense to the lead investor that the train was moving with or without them. And that's what investors really want. They don't wanna be the one that is making all this happen. They wanna get on something that's already moving, right? With or without them. And so uh, that's where staggering and building this momentum can work to your advantage. So when talking about prospecting, people are more important than firms. A lot of folks jump to the brand names that they want, um, but people are more important than firms. Fundraising is about relationships. Uh, ultimately, there's going to be a human that you are doing business with for many years, right? Uh, they're going to have to advocate for you within their firm right, if it's a VC. And so it, it all comes down to relationships. So don't think too much about like brand name firms, instead of think about the people that you wanna be working with. Um, focusing on people is also just more effective than firm hunting, right? You might, you know, if you're, if you're working top down with firms, you may be missing people that are like really interested in what you're building. And there might be some firm that you have not heard of, but that is perfect for the type of startup that you're building. Right? And by working through the people who are most likely to be really excited about what you're building, you're gonna find your ways to the right investors. Um, also, people have different roles and investment focuses at VCs. So with roles, you know, an associate has a different role than a venture partner, which has a different role than a principal, which has a different role than a partner. All those different types of roles have different levels of autonomy and the ability to make investments, right? So you know, I think associates can be really helpful with with your fundraise, but you shouldn't be having five meetings with an associate, right? <laughs> um, you know, so I, understanding what those roles are, are really important. Also, different partners within a venture, venture firm might invest in completely different areas. So that's why it's really important to understand who you're talking to and why, um, because they may have different investment focuses. So question came up before, uh, is a big question. Where do you find these investors? How do you get this list together? How do you build, build your funnel? So let's talk about prospecting tactics for a second. First, good old fashioned research. This is a screenshot of Crunchbase Pro, which you can use to search for investors based on what school they went to, their past employers, where they live. So it's a really good way to start to find investors who might share things in common with you. This is Crunchbase Pro, but there are a lot of other tools out there like Signal, AngelList, lots of others. 
Um, there are people that are kind of creating their own air tables of their own investor networks that you can access that are public online. So there are lots of public resources that you can use to start thinking about initial lists. So always good to start with research. Um, but what I will say is by far the best tactic is other founders. And this is not just peer founders. Peer founders who are also at the seed stage, sure, really great to, for, for this as well. But what I'm more so talking about is founders that are ahead of you in the startup life cycle. Um, if you can build relationships with startups that are a year or two ahead of you in their startup life cycle and, and those founders, then those founders, they already raised the seed round, right? They, they just went through this process six to 12 months ago. They're gonna have really good first party intelligence around who you should talk to. Not only will they have like good insights, but they'll literally have spreadsheets that they made when they were managing their fundraising process. So when I, when I was raising my round, I, I had a friend who was literally just a year ahead of me in, in, his, in his process. Uh, you know, we had a good relationship. He was helping me with a lot of stuff, not just with fundraising, but just general mentorship. And when it came time for me to raise a round, he introduced me to some of his investors and introduced me to some people that he met through his fundraising process that did not invest in his round. One of, the, one of his existing investors raised, invested in my round. One investor that did not invest in his round, but that he met through his fundraise, invested in my round, right? So building these relationships with founders that are just a little bit ahead of you can be really, really valuable for reasons that are outside of fundraising, but especially for fundraising. So build these relationships with founders that are a little bit ahead of you. Then the big secret here is to build relationships before you raise. If you're fundraising, sure, you can build these prospect lists and try to build the, these, uh, build that funnel. But if you can do this before your fundraising, it's going to make it a lot easier. So a few tips here. First, spend 10% of your time building relationships with value adders. Um, I say value adders specifically, I, I alluded to this before. Don't just build relationships with investors for the sake of building relationships with investors because you think they can invest later, right? Um, People that you're building relationships with should be able to provide value to the business beyond money. Um, and that's gonna ensure not only that you're building relationships with the right people who are gonna be really interested in what you're building and are, who are going to be able to provide value add beyond money, but it's gonna make sure that this 10% of your time that you're spending is also helping your business today and not just helping your business in the future. Right, so build relationships with value adders. What that means is you need to genuinely seek help from people who can help with specific challenges. So it's not just about saying, hey, would love to hear what you think about our startup, or hey, would love to hear what you think about my deck. That's just like too vague and people are not gonna be really responsive. If instead you can say, hey, you built a startup in this space that did X, Y, and Z. We're thinking about this specific distribution channel that you likely have experience with, would love to know if we have any blind spots based on some of our assumptions. That is the level of specificity that makes it hard for someone to ignore an email. If you know, my last startup was a freelance marketplace, if someone emails me asking about something specific with freelance marketplaces around creative work, like I feel like I have to answer. I feel like I have to help because 25% or sorry, 25 minutes of my time can probably save that person like three months of headache that I once dealt with, right? So it almost feels irresponsible for me to not help them. Um, so be really specific with what you're looking for help with and it's gonna make it so much easier for you to build these relationships. And if someone helps you, go back to them and show them the ROI of their time, advice and network. Um, when someone comes back to me and tells me that how something I did helped them, it makes my week right? It gets me even more emotionally invested in what they're building, right? And so that is really important here. That's part of how you close the loop and build these into really strong relationships. Uh, and then the final step here is if you can get these people who you're building these relationships with and building authentic, right, authentic, genuine relationships, um, if you can give them a advanced notice when you're thinking about raising around, it gives them a window of time where they get to look good, right? They get to look like someone who knows about a founder raising a, a round before anyone else. And you give them the opportunity to, to 
basically introduce you to people in their network um, without it really being about, you know, money quite yet. Right. And so that, that's one thing that you can do here to take to call, to take advantage of this, these connections that you're building is like give them advanced heads up. Uh, so some takeaways from prospecting. Someone just asked, can we get a copy? Love to answer that in real time. Yes, we're going to be sharing these slides and the, the presentation after. Um, prospecting takeaways. 20 prospects for every spot available. Focus your prospecting on people, not just firms. Get prospects through research and through relationships. And then build genuine relationships with investors and founders before raising around. Uh, so next, we're going to go into fundraising mode and stacking up meetings. Um, you know, I'll answer some questions here. Um, the other thing I will say, um, yeah, let me just go ahead and answer some questions. Do, do, do. Let me just see. Key fundraising tools for seed round. Uh, I'm about to talk about that. That's a that's a great segue. We'll, we'll talk about that literally in, in like two slides. Um, if we have a bunch of different verticals, should we just pick the largest focus on that for the pitch and ignore the others? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this this is less of a fundraising question, more of a strategy question. I think you know one thing that I see with, with narratives and just strategy in the early stages is if you can talk about your like initial vertical, which is your beachhead market, and talk about how you're going to really nail it there and how you're going to be able to spread to other verticals. Starting with more focus, especially at the seed stage, is better just so, because you can tell a more clear story, whereas a lot of times when founders start with too broad of a scope in their narrative and strategy, um, it can just result in investors having a lot of big questions. Is pre-revenue typically a pre-seed round? Pre-seed and seed aren't necessarily about, they're correlated between pre-revenue and revenue, and they're correlated with stage. It's more about the types of investors you're targeting and the round size than it is, um, you know, the, the progress, right? Like, uh, so, you know, pre-seed and seed are more marketing messaging. Uh, I actually have another workshop on valuations, uh, which is where that those terms are more important that I, I can share with this group afterwards. Um, do, do, do. Uh, some of the other questions, uh, what, when nurturing relationships, what are the do's and don'ts of what you share and don't share? Great question. We're, we're actually going to talk about this in a second, but I do want to address it head on because it's a really good question. The way that you talk, the way that you give information should be correlated to the depth of the funnel. So at the highest level, if you're just sending an intro email, you should give the least amount of information. If you're in the final diligence, you should be giving all the information and everything between should correlate. So we'll talk about that more. Um, but that's a really good question. And the rest of the questions I'm about to tackle. So let's dive into initiating fundraising mode and stacking up meetings. So you've built up these relationships, you've warmed these things up. You, now you're ready to turn on fundraising mode, right? So this is the first step is kind of warm things up first. Now you want to turn on fundraising mode. The first thing you need to do is make sure you have your materials ready. That means you need to have a teaser deck, which is what you might use in an initial email to get a first meeting with an investor. This does not have all the information. It has the minimum amount of information needed to get a first meeting. Then you have a full presentation deck and a readable deck. Presentation deck is one you use to present. Readable deck is one that you might be able to send via email afterwards. You want a supporting financial model. You also need a safe or convertible note. The reason you need all this stuff is on the off chance that someone says yes, right? Um, in, in the off chance that you have meeting and someone says they want to invest, you want to be able to get that money in the bank as soon as possible. My first round, the first investor I talked to who, who said yes, uh, was ready to wire the money right then and there. It took me a week to get that person the convertible note. It ended up taking me four months to get that person's money in the bank, which included two surprise visits to their office that I arranged with their secretary without them knowing. 
right? So uh, have all this ready so that you can move quickly. Don't create friction for yourself. So have all this up front. Then you want to quietly close at least one investor using some of those close relationships so that you can have at least some momentum, right? Z there's a big difference between having one check in the bank and zero. So quietly close one investor and then turn on fundraising mode. And when you turn on fundraising mode, you should try to be getting, try to be getting as many warm introductions as possible to your prospects as you can. So warm introductions are always preferred. But I want to be very clear about this. Cold emails do work. Uh, my biggest investor came from a cold email. The key is they have to be good cold emails. Bad cold emails are very bad and can burn bridges and can actually result in, even if you get a warm introduction later and someone you know, checks their Gmail inbox and saw that they got some kind of spammy email from you three weeks earlier, that can burn a bridge, right? So a good rule of thumb is that a good cold email should take you 30 minutes or more to write. It should be well-researched. It should refer to something that you've read that is personalized to the, that person. It, it should be really personalized, concise, and clear about why you should talk to them, why they should talk to you, right? So um, if it takes less than 30 minutes to write a single cold email, then it probably is not thoughtful enough. Uh, so that's a good rule of thumb here. But I will say good cold emails do work. And lot, lots of investors don't respond to cold emails, but good cold emails do work if you can't find a warm introduction. And once you get this process moving, you need to keep filling the top of the funnel. The last thing you want to happen is to get midway through this process, half your round is filled, and then you look at your funnel and you're like, uh-oh, I, I forgot to stop filling it. Uh, and now I got to go kind of kickstart this whole fundraising process again, right? Literally, if, if you think the last check in your round is going to be wired in like three minutes, you should still be building the top of the funnel. Like until all the money is in the bank, please, please, please keep filling the top of the funnel. So now we'll, we'll talk about pitching and closing. I'll get through the rest of this and, and then we'll open up the rest of the time for Q&A. Um, if folks do have to leave, I'll just kind of leave my information. Um, uh, here's my, you can connect with me more there. Um, if folks do have to leave early. Uh, and we'll send follow-up information, but uh, cool. Pitching and closing. Uh, so let's talk about this. Uh, oops, sorry. Let's talk about goals for the first meeting. So the first goal is discover if there's goal alignment, right? In the first meeting with an investor, if there's not goal alignment, then don't bother going any further. Just move on. Second, learn about their decision-making process. The reason this is important in the first meeting is because one, this will tell you how fast they can move. And so you'll know down the road if you, you just can't push them to move as fast as you wanna push them, or if they're dragging you along, right? If they say that they can make quick decisions and it's taking them weeks and weeks to get back to you, then clearly you're getting, getting strung along. Whereas if they say that it, they have to have a partner meeting every month to make a decision and they just had their most recent partner meeting yesterday, you're not going to be able to push them faster than, you know, four weeks to make a decision, right? And so learning about their decision-making pro process in the first meeting is really valuable. Then get them excited about the opportunity, right? So, uh, you know, this is about um, like, well, if you don't get them excited about the opportunity, it's just not going to go any further. Right, so this is kind of obvious, um, but make sure you're taking care of your other goals too, which are number one and two, um, before worrying too much about getting them excited. Uh, some rules for the first meeting. Rule number one, ask questions before you start pitching. A few reasons for this. One, you should assume that if you start talking about your business, you're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about your business. So if you don't ask your questions first, they might not ever get answered. So that's one reason. Second reason is it helps balance out the power dynamic a little bit. It's a little nerve wracking sitting down and talking to an investor. So starting by asking questions 
gets them to answer your questions, balances out that power dynamic, helps you settle in and get a little bit more confident. And it's going to give them the sense that you're probably asking these questions of a lot of investors, which shows that you're running a really good fundraising process, which just really helps facilitate these conversations a bit more. Rule number two, unless you have full conviction around what your valuation is, don't talk about the valuation in a first meeting. Um, you don't want to get caught in this rabbit hole debating valuation early on. If an investor is excited enough about your business, they'll be pretty flexible in valuation. So don't worry about this in the first meeting. If you get asked, just punt. Say that you haven't figured that out yet. Um, you're just early in the process talking to investors. Um, you can ask them what they're seeing in the market, but uh, you don't have to commit to anything in the first meeting. Rule number three, keep it conversational. This is not going to be like Shark Tank, right? You're not going to have a two and a half minute monologue to go through your whole pitch. You're actually probably going to get interrupted pretty quickly with their questions. And so you should be ready to handle this in a conversational way. So you should be able to go through your whole narrative and, and give the pitch, but you should embrace the fact that they are going to interrupt and you should, you should be ready to take the conversation in different weaving directions. Some questions you should ask in the first meeting. First, ask what a good outcome is for them. That's about getting to the core of goal alignment. Ask what is your typical check size and or ownership target? Uh, and then third, uh, what is your investment process? Right, this helps you get to the, you know, how they might fit into your round composition, um, you know, what their process looks like, if they're going to string you along later, really gives you a lot of the valuable information that you need. You can ask other questions too, um, but these are some really important ones that I would ask. This is the VC's typical process. Um, you know, starts with an initial meeting, then goes into some basic analysis. Uh, then due diligence where they may dive into your uh, product a little bit more. Um, then partner meeting, then confirmatory diligence. That's a good sign if you're getting into more diligence after the partner meeting. And then a term sheet. Right. And so that's the process. You know, at any point they can pass. Um, embrace the pass. Right. Like the, the thing I'll say here is no is way better than maybe. Investors have no. Uh, they have no incentive to tell you no. Other than just being like founder friendly, um, they have every incentive to string you along in the in the off chance that you start to do really well, and then they can get into your round. Um, and so, yeah, if an investor is stringing you along, you can just write them off as a no, and focus your attention towards the top of the funnel to the investors that you can get to a yes. All you need is a handful of yeses to get this whole thing to work. Right, so don't worry about the investors that are just like in that middle ground that might be stringing you along. By the way, someone asked, is there gonna be a video of this presentation shared? Uh, yeah, it is being recorded. So a summary and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, you're, giving it up, you're giving up scarce equity in your company, not asking for money. That's the mindset you need to have here. Create a sense of urgency by cultivating authentic competition for your round. Startup investor fit goes both ways. It's not just about you selling to investors, right? This is also like a recruiting exercise. Build relationships before you need to fundraise. Put yourself in a position where you'll have to say no to investors. Uh, this is a full-time process. It should be done as quickly as possible. And remember that three by one rule, three investors and in final diligence for every spot available. And then again, experienced founders who've done this before can put a seed round together in as quickly as a month. Easier said than done, um, but speed is the important thing here. Uh, and so um, you want to put yourself in your position in a position where you can go as quickly as possible. And so that's all I've got. I can spend the rest of the time answering questions. I accidentally sent the link in the Q and A thing, so I'll put it in the general chat. Um, you can feel free to connect with me there. I write about some of this stuff more. Um, we'll also send follow-ups with links to some other workshops that I do. Um, but yeah, I will go and comb through these questions. Let's see.
what kind of diligence can you build up if there is no financial evidence yet? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I would say financial evidence is just data, right? And so I think with de-risking at the early stages, what you need is data. Now that data can be, you know, te from like actual experiments that you've run or early metrics on your product or whatever the case may be. It can also be anecdotes, right? So if you have one big case study with a customer where you increase their ROI on a certain part of their funnel by 98% and the industry average is this, so th this actually revolution revolutionizes their sales process, right? Like I'm just making this up, but then that is really valuable. Um, now an investor may have questions about like, okay, that's one customer, great. What are the risky assumptions around if this actually applies to other customers or not, or if this is just a fluke, but you, you can use data and that is not just financial to talk about what you've de-risked early. But that, that, it's a really good question. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see here, I'll just answer that. As someone with a tech background, any good things no, to know moving into a more physical business? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it, <laughs> the thing I would recommend um, if you're more technical, and, and you may, this is a little bit of my mindset, I'm, I'm a former math nerd, um, is you know take a scientific method approach to some of this stuff when you're thinking about your narrative, right? Talk about data, talk about this as like experiments, talk about what you've de-risked, what the big risks are, what your hypotheses are, right? I think that's, you know, at just really high level stuff um, without knowing more about your business. Uh, if I'm talking to like technical people, like, you know, you wanna lean into your superpowers when you're fundraising as a, as a human. Um, and so if you're an amazing storyteller, then like lean into your storytelling. One of my founder friends was so good at storytelling. He, he was a creative writing major in college where I was a math major in college. The ways that we fundraised, you could have probably predicted that. Um, and the way that we told our respective stories about our startups, you could have maybe predicted that. Um, and so just lean into what you're, like wh where you feel like you're the strongest. Um, Kind of dive a little deeper into fundraising mode and how to move along. Would do you consider this to be most possible, mostly contacting possible investors? Yeah, once you're in fundraising mode, like you should have done some of your diligence already to have confidence that like you have a good narrative. You can even like test your narrative with some friends or some close investors that you know that are just willing to give you completely unvarnished feedback so that you can make sure that but before you actually go into fundraising mode, you have confidence that you have a really good narrative. Um, so you should be confident in your narrative before you go into full fundraising mode. Once you go into full fundraising mode, you, you of course are gonna be iter iterating and improving along the way, but you wanna feel pretty confident um, so that most of your time is spent just like working the funnel, like a sales process. Uh, do, do, do. Let's see, um, answer that. Uh, disclosing bootstrapped investment number, how important is it? Yeah, I think, um, to be frank, it's not that important to investors. Investors don't really care how much, well, they, they might care a little bit to know how much skin you have in the game, but sometimes it can actually be a negative thing, honestly. Like if they, if they, if they think that you have not made that much progress relative to how much you've invested in the company, that can be a negative signal. Um, and so uh, I would just say investors don't really look that much at it. They more so care about like where the business is headed. They're investing at this point in time Right, so it, it doesn't really matter how much you've invested to a new investor. They just wanna know that they can get their equity target at a valuation they're comfortable with and that they believe that it's going to be a good return for them. How can we get in touch with me? Um, I just uh, sent my, I, was, I sent my website that you can check out and follow up with me online, but uh, 
Also, we'll just send out more information about how to get in touch with us after through Startup Grind. Um, let's see. What are what uh, uh, what are some ways to develop relationships with investors when there aren't events, Christmas parties, and local tech meetups like what's going on right now? Um, again, this is where it's important to have specific asks. Right, you should have something. You should have a challenge facing your business where you like really want to get some good advice from someone who has experience with that. Then using that to then go and find people who might through like previous startups that found it. Or not investors directly, but just successful founders who are further along, they are going to know investors who you can talk to. So not just focusing on building relationships with investors, but people who just are, are well networked, who can help you with specific challenges that you're facing today. That is one of the easiest ways to start to cultivate your own network. Right, but that requires thoughtfulness. It requires that you think about the the things that you're actually going to listen to feedback on, right? Um, you know, uh, th that's important, right? Um, but that that's I, I would come up with really handcrafted specific asks, and then use that as a way to, uh, you know, find people who can help with those things. Uh, what do I think about angel investors investing sweat equity? Um, yeah, I don't know. I I think they're they're like they have to really have some skin in the game. It, it's easy for folks to like. It's easy for folks to say that. Like I I can go and I'm just gonna make this up. Like well, let me say this. It can work. It can be good. Just be careful. I can sit here and say that my hourly rate is a thousand dollars an hour, and so if we work together, I, I'm I don't consults, by the way. I'm just giving a, a, a bad example. Um, but someone can say that uh, their hourly rate's $1,000 an hour. And so by working together, it's this type of engagement, which is this much money, which is, you know, this much of an investment when you're not really getting any cash. right? <laughs> um, and so like, be careful with people like, you know, investing sweat equity and quantifying their expertise with dollar amounts. Um, just be careful there. Uh, doo -doo -doo. But otherwise, like if you can clearly quantify it, then by all means, just quantify it as a dollar amount. Uh, but I would make sure that like, you, you know, you're getting value out of the consulting hours or whatever that they're doing for you. Uh, doo -doo -doo. What happens if some investors are accepting us at a certain valuation while others want a lower one? Great question. This is where safes and convertible notes are great. One of the things about safes and convertible notes is that technically speaking, each investor can be in at a different valuation, right? So you can get in, like, there are a few ways this usually goes. One is that you may get early investors in at, uh, well, sorry, three ways that this goes. One is you start too high. You start with a really high valuation. You're actually able to get some investors in at that high valuation, but as you get to bigger investors, they get a little more skeptical and put, try to push your valuation down. Um, in that case, what you might do is say like, yeah, okay, we're gonna lower the valuation because we're just not able to get the right VCs we want at this, val at this higher valuation. And what you would then probably do is go back to the earlier investors and do right by them, amend that, amend their, notes so that they are investing at the same valuation as the later investors that came in, right? So that you're not giving them the raw end of the deal where like they invested at a $9 million valuation and they took the early risk, but someone coming in later is getting a $6 million valuation. Like why are they getting the raw? I, if I were the angel investor, I would be upset with that, right? And so you can do right by them. The other way is you start too low and then it goes up. Right, you start you start with a five million dollar valuation. It's like you end up generating a lot of demand, uh, and you're able to raise it for the later investors. And in that case, bravo for the early investors. Their their investment has already appreciated, right? And so like that's just part of the game. Um, and so you would have a higher valuation for those slightly later investors, but the early ones would be rewarded with their risk. Um, so it, it can be a little fluid. Um, yeah, I'm going to share 
link. Good uh, article from Paul Graham about high resolution fundraising, which is the extreme version of this, which is where you literally have a different valuation for every single investor in these early stages. Um, but uh, I will reply that way. Cool. Uh, How do you recommend going about fundraising in the like early stage R and D and MVP building process? Again, like this is just where it gets back to risk and what you've de-risked. Um, look, if if you're a B two B SaaS company, um then the risk is more about adoption. And so if you haven't built an MVP, unless you have like a team that comes from Stripe and you're, you know, building a new payment SaaS thing, right? And you have this crazy insight about the market around an unsolved problem that Stripe wasn't able to solve. So you're going to build a new company around that. Like that's a case where you could probably raise around. Um, but ultimately... Like it's all, it's less about like traction and revenue and where you are in the market. It's just more about what, what you've de-risked about the company and um, like what an investor is betting on. Uh, do, do, do. Someone asked about depth of financial model. Um, you know, like your, your profit, like just have one financial model. Um, it should go into a level of depth that all, all investors are comfortable with. I once had an investor who was like, yeah, can we see a five-year pro rata? And um, <laughs> I, I basically copied and pasted all the cells from two years out to five years out. And was like, look, this is early stage stuff. I don't know what's gonna happen beyond the next two years, um, but like, this is my rough estimation. So I, I just wouldn't get too deep into like, robust cash flow statements. I think, you know, if you have a, if your business is like, if cash flow is a really important part of your business and you need to really understand that to run your business, then maybe you should have more in depth of a cash flow statement than just like a typical B2B SaaS company, um, right? If, if dealing with inventory is really important to how you think about the key le like business drivers, then you might need to have more depth there. I think it's like whatever you need to be a mastery, master over your business. Um, and, and it doesn't need to be something that like, you know, JP Morgan would be like, yep, this fits our bar. It's more about just like, hey, do you understand your business at these early stages? Uh, someone asked, is it okay to use services of investment brokers for warm introductions? I generally recommend against that. Um, like ultimately you should be finding people who are providing value beyond money and investment brokers are incentivized to just find you money, right? So um, like, again, this is an opportunity not just to raise money, but to add to your team. And I, I don't think that investment brokers um, like are thinking that way at all. In my opinion uh, is hiring an agency to build brand identity and creative direction, uh, legitimate incentive to bring investors to the table. Good question. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it depends on what you're building, right? Like, um, if you're if you're like a boring shipping container SaaS management solution, no, right? <laughs> like, you know, your success is not going to be um, you know, won or lost with branding. But if you're building a direct to consumer product, then having a really strong brand could be really important. And so I think it, it depends. And, and again, it comes back to risk. Like if building a strong brand is something that you need to show to show that you're, you know, you have really good progress uh, and that they're gonna believe that people are gonna love your brand, um, then by all means use that. Um, cool. Looks like fo the startup grant folks are joining back and uh, lots of other questions that we may not be able to get to, but we'll send my information out so we can answer more questions if needed.
Yeah, no, this was this was this was amazing, Mike. I uh, like I said at the top of the uh, at the top of the presentation, I'm not currently in a position to fundraise, but now you're making me want to go think of all these things I can do to start a company because uh, now I got the blueprint to go and raise money. Uh, mm -hmm. now There's a reason why for the last 13 years, startups overwhelmingly prefer to build on top of AWS. We have the largest number of services, making it easy for you to take on some of the biggest challenges with the smallest teams. We also have partnerships with the top VCs, accelerators, and incubators around the world, making it easier to secure your next round of funding. I'm a solution architect uh, with the AWS uh, Ed Start uh, program. Uh, what we do is we work with startups in the uh, education sector and we help them build their uh, uh, services on AWS. So We Power Tech is AWS's diversity and inclusion outreach program. The program is really twofold. One is to increase the number of underrepresented technologists within the industry, and the second is to provide a platform for them to be seen and heard. If you're wondering how the AWS evangelism team might be able to help your startup, there are many ways. We're technically credible across our entire catalog of products, so we can help you figure out which services might be able to meaningfully impact your business. We also want to help tell your story. So if you're building something cool, we want to know about it and help spread that message to the world. So you might end up on stage at an event like AWS Summit. If you're a startup, you should also definitely check out the AWS Lofts. These are event spaces that are free to anyone with an AWS account. And you can treat them like co-working spaces, but the awesome thing about them is that we also have people like technical evangelists like myself, solutions architects that come and give hands-on technical workshops and sessions to help you learn how to more effectively utilize the AWS products and platforms that you're already building on top of. We are a dedicated team of people that love startups, that we just want to come and help you with whatever we can, whether it be technical or business focused. We are here to help guide you and make sure that you know you do have a say in what's going on. We do get your feedback. We do bring that feedback to the service teams. That is what we're here for.